Well, Jim, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a delight to join uh, politics and eggs and gloating over the Super Bowl breakfast. <laughs> um, I have to say that I, I have been a bit conflicted over the last couple of years, uh, first with the Dodgers Red Sox series and now this. Um, <laughs> And I've been betting uh, on Los Angeles, and I now have to pay my second lunch for Joe Kennedy and whole, his whole staff. Uh, I am determined to beat that guy at one of these days. Um, and I appreciate your expression, your condolence over our loss in the Super Bowl, but you didn't look very sad. And I just say the condolence was less than perfectly heartfelt. Um, well, it's a, a treat to be with you today and to be part of such a venerable tradition uh, as this lunch. So I'm, I'm uh, flattered and grateful to be invited and have a lot I'd like to discuss with you today. But I thought I would uh, begin by reading a letter to you um, that you may be familiar with. Dear Mr. President, I have been privileged to serve as our country's 26th Secretary of Defense, which has allowed me to serve alongside our men and women of the Department of Defense of our citizens and our ideals. One core belief I have always held is that our strength as a nation is inextricably linked to the strength of our unique and comprehensive system of alliances and partnerships. While the U.S. remains the indispensable nation in the free world, we cannot protect our interests or serve that role effectively without maintaining strong alliances and showing respect to those allies. I believe we must be resolute and unambiguous in our approach to those countries whose strategic interests are increasingly in tension with ours. It is clear that China and Russia, for example, want to shape a world consistent with their authoritarian model, gaining veto authority over other nations' economic, diplomatic, and security decisions to promote their own interests at the expense of their neighbors, America, and our allies. This is why we must use all the tools of American power to provide for the common defense. My views on treating allies with respect and also being clear-eyed about both malign actors and strategic competitors are strongly held and informed by over four decades of immersion in these issues. We must do everything possible to advance an international order that is most conducive to our security, prosperity, and values. And we are strengthened in this effort by the solidarity of our alliances. Because you have the right to have a Secretary of Defense whose views are better aligned with yours on these and other subjects, I believe it is right for me to step down from my position. This, of course, is the letter of resignation dated December 20th from Secretary of Defense Mattis. And I wanted to begin with that letter because I think it sounds an alarm that we all need to hear and listen to. Uh, and it sounds an alarm that was once again, run aloud uh, just last week when we had the testimony of the heads of our intelligence agencies. Because like Secretary Mattis's letter, and, and I'm sure part of what informs Secretary Mattis's views, is the conclusion of our intelligence agencies that Russia and China are increasingly aligned and pose a threat to our democratic way of life. China is becoming increasingly authoritarian. Russia has now for decades, and they are leading part of a worldwide challenge to the very idea of democracy. And this, to me, is the lost story in the events of the last couple of years. Uh, as we have followed the daily ins and outs of the Russian investigation, as we have watched what Rudy Giuliani said in the morning and then contradicted in the afternoon, uh, and then contradicted in the evening, we have lost sight of the bigger picture of what's happening around the world. We've lost sight of the fact that Russia's interference in our affairs was not an isolated occurrence. Russia has been interfering in the democratic affairs of other nations for a long time. And the challenge to us and to our way of living, our form of governance, does not come from Russia alone. Russia, in fact, is part of a global phenomenon a global rise in autocracy that we see in places like Egypt and in Turkey and Poland and in Hungary, in the Philippines and in Brazil. 
We have lived lives ever since uh, the end of World War II, in which the world has been ever expanding in its freedoms, with more people living in a free society, more people with a free press, more people who, who can associate with whom they want or love whom they wish. And I think we came to the belief that this was somehow inexorable, that like, uh, to paraphrase Martin Luther King, the moral arc of the universe may be long, but it bends towards justice, only to learn that it is not bending towards justice, that it is not immutable, and that, in fact, if we are to be candid and clear-eyed about the situation, we cannot say with confidence that the world next year will be more free than it is today. And with even less confidence can we declare that the world will be more free for our children than it has been for us. And this to me is the grand ideological challenge of our time. It's something that the intelligence chiefs talked about in that hearing. Now, that was lost, like a great many things, by some very other serious differences between what our intelligence agencies have to say and what our President of the United States has to say. In that report, of course, the intelligence chiefs concluded that on the basis of what they see, on the basis of what we see, in our committee as well, there was no indication of a commitment on the part of North Korea to permanently and completely denuclearize. If there were, I think we would have seen long before now what has to be a fundamental prerequisite to any kind of a serious negotiation over denuclearization, and that is a complete itinerary, a complete list of all their nuclear facilities, of all their missile facilities, but of course we have nothing like it. And then there were the serious differences over the strength of ISIS and the withdrawal from Syria, with the President concluding, much like the threat from North Korea, which he said is essentially gone, we can now sleep well, because he has such a great relationship with the dear leader. The President declared ISIS is finished. We've had a complete victory. But of course, this is not what our intelligence agencies see, because it is not consistent with the reality, which is, yes, ISIS has lost most of its territorial holdings, but nonetheless remains a virulent threat uh, both to our allies and to ourselves, to our personnel abroad and to ourselves here at home. And it's not just the threat from ISIS that our intel chiefs warned us of, but also a growing organizational command structure of Al-Qaeda around the world, which continues to encourage attacks against us. Uh, and perhaps lost most completely was the conclusion of our agencies that the most acute terrorist threat we face is, by the way, not from the southern border, which did not merit a mention, but from homegrown extremists. And so our intel chief sounded the alarm about this. At the same time, they pointed out that when it came to some of the nuclear threats facing the country, the threat posed by Iran has actually diminished, at least as far as nuclear weapons are concerned, because Iran was complying with the nuclear agreement. Now, I don't know how many of you watched the President's interview on CBS uh, yesterday, but the President was asked about the intel agency's conclusion that Iran had been complying with the nuclear deal. And the President's answer was, I don't believe that. I don't believe them. I don't believe our intelligence agencies. Now, I would never suggest that the President or the Congress should be an uncritical consumer of the analysis of our intelligence agencies. We should be skeptical consumers. We should test the assumptions and the conclusions of our intelligence agencies. Like any intelligence service, they are not clairvoyant. They do not have a crystal ball. But it's one thing to be a skeptic. It's one thing to test the assumptions. It's one thing to push back and say, You've concluded this about ISIS. Show me why. Show me why that notwithstanding that they control far less territory, they remain a pernicious threat. We should want a president to test the assumptions of what anyone tells him. But it's quite another to reject it simply because it doesn't align with a story you prefer to tell. And that's the problem that we have when the President disagrees with our intelligence basic uh, experts, and not because of division with the intelligence community or 
other sources of intelligence that the president may have, but because it just doesn't fit with what he wants to tell us. He wants to tell us a story of a great agreement with the dear leader, never mind that it's not true. And anyone who disagrees with him, whether it's the chiefs or intelligence agencies, they don't know what they're talking about, according to the president. They need to go back to school. They're naive. Well, you can say a lot of things about our intelligence agencies. Naive is not a word I would use. And here's the other risk for the president who will not listen to his intelligence chiefs. We have the best intelligence in the world. Certainly not infallible, as we have seen in the past, not infallible, but nonetheless the best in the world. That is a tremendous resource for a president of the United States. And a president ought to use that to inform decisions. What's going on right now in Argentina? How strong, uh, or, or Venezuela, or Colombia, or Mexico, or what's going on in Russia, or Ukraine? What should our response be to the murder of Jamal Khashoggi? What was the role of the Crown Prince? What would be the response if we were to place sanctions not just on people who carried out the murder, but someone believed to have been responsible for ordering the murder? What would the result be? How stable is the House of Saud? You ask your agencies these questions because it informs the judgments you make about your policy. If you ignore what they have to say, because you'd rather believe something else than the country suffers. We are less safe because we have a president making decisions based on a fiction, based on a world of his imagining, not the world as we see it and as we know it. But there are other risks as well with the president rejecting the advice of the intelligence community. It also means that sources of information are going to dry up. People cooperate with our agencies for a variety of reasons. Some do it for money. But others do it because they're ideologically motivated, because they live in countries with repressive regimes, because they believe in what America stands for. And when they see a president of the United States reject what they put their lives on the line to provide, then why do it? Why do it? And so sources of information dry up, not just from individual human sources, but also from intelligence sources among our allies. They cannot trust also that the President of the United States will keep confidential information uh, that they receive, they're not going to trust us with that information. And finally, there's also a risk in a President who ignores or disputes and denigrates the professionals within our intelligence community, and that is it invites our enemies and our adversaries to do the same. What could be better for Vladimir Putin than a president of the United States who says, I don't particularly believe our intelligence agencies. I don't believe them when they tell me that Russia interfered in our democracy. Well, that's just perfect for Vladimir Putin. When the president of the United States is asked, as he was a year or two ago, why should you criticize everyone in the world, but you can't criticize Vladimir Putin? The man's a killer. And his answer is, are we so different? That is exactly the story the Russians want to tell. The story the Russians want to tell is there's no, there's no confrontation between Democrats and autocrats. It's only between autocrats and hypocrites. We in Russia, we have no more democracy, or very little. We're a thugocracy. We're a dictatorship, but you know something? You're no different. You're just a hypocrite about it. That's the story the Russians want to tell. And when a president of the United States repeats that falsehood, it does tremendous damage to the very idea of America. Two years ago, I went to a national security conference in Munich, and it was a delegation led by John McCain. Traveling with John McCain is wonderful. Um, for many reasons. He's a hero and great company, but he can also invite anyone he wants to dinner and they will usually come. And so we had dinner with Bill Gates and Bono, which is not my usual dinner company. <laughs> and the evening went on and we uh, finished dinner and dessert and we started telling jokes and then Bono told a, told a joke about being Irish. 
And then he got very serious and said, I'm very proud of the Irish, I'm very proud of Ireland, but Ireland, like most countries, is just a country. America is also an idea. And it's that idea of America right now that is at risk. Which brings me to the final point I want to raise with you tonight. There is, as I have mentioned, a challenge to the very idea of democracy around the world. And when you read the report of our intel chiefs, that worldwide threat report that they testified about, among the most stark conclusions, in addition to highlighting this ideological struggle we are in, they conclude that our allies are deciding how much they can rely upon America. And essentially, they're hedging their bets. Now, this is a terrible tragedy for the rest of the world that has always looked to us as a champion of democracy and human rights. It's also a terrible tragedy for us. And one of the, the most difficult conclusions for me of the last two years as I've looked into both Russia's meddling in our affairs as well as this global trend towards autocracy is the realization that so the threat to our democracy right now is most pronounced from within, not from without. That the threat from Russia is less than the threat to the health of our democracy than what is coming from within our country right now. The Russians can't cause us to distrust our own intelligence agencies. The Russians can't cause us to distrust our own FBI. The Russians can't cause us to denigrate our media and believe that it is the enemy of the people. The Russians can't cause us to distrust our justice system or belittle our judges based on their ethnic origin. Only we can do that to ourselves. But that is what has happened. And we have a combination, I think, of a deeply unethical president who is not committed to these institutions of our democracy, and a Congress that for the last two years has been utterly unwilling to stand up to. And this combination has our republic and its democracy trembling. Trembling. And I think it's a time when all of us need to consider what we can do in our public office, in our private life, in our civic life, in our corporate life, to stand up and represent the values of this country for as long as we do not see them reflected in the Oval Office. To remind ourselves at home and our friends abroad that we are will always be devoted to democracy and liberty and human rights. And we will hold that torch high as long as they cannot see it from the Oval Office. Now there's a great deal propelling this global trend. And not unlike other times in history, a big driver of this rise of authoritarianism and rise of autocracy are tremendous and disruptive challenges and changes to our economy that began with globalization and that are continuing with automation. We have the confluence of two global trends right now which are a supreme challenge to us. And that is economic changes that are every bit as disruptive as the Industrial Revolution. Going on at the same time that we have changes in how we get our information every bit as profound as the invention of the printing press. With the proliferation of social media. An environment in which lies and hatred and fear can spread far faster than truth. And combining this uh, with an administration in which the argument is continually made to us that there is no truth, that we are all entitled to our own alternate facts, that fact truth isn't truth, there is nothing more corrosive to our democracy than that idea. So these are the challenges we face. But I have to tell you, we have faced worse in the past. Worse divisions during the Vietnam War. 
worst division certainly during the Civil War, worst cataclysms during the Depression and World War II, and we will get through this as well. At the end of the day, I always come back to something Bill Clinton once said, which was as true when he said it as it is today. There's nothing wrong in America that can't be cured by what's right in America. There is an awful lot right in America that will see us through this challenging time. I thank you.